introducing today's webinar. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for ICTs, and we're also the organizers of the AI for Good Global Summit, alongside the XPRIZE Foundation, and in partnership with 38 UN agencies and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of the summit is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and scale the solutions for global impact. We are very pleased today to discuss creating safe digital spaces for all through esports and AI. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, but as always, we are counting on you at the participants to help make this an engaging discussion. For this, we will be using the Q&A functionality, which you can find just left of center at the bottom of your screen, and there is also the chat functionality. Now, just be sure to set the message recipient to all panelists and attendees if you want your message to be public, and not just all panelists. You can select this just above the message box. Now, further ado, I am very pleased to introduce you to our moderator today, inventor and BBC Click presenter, LJ Rich. She will lead the session and she will introduce all of the other distinguished panelists. Over to you, LJ. Thanks so much, Ida. And hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest installment of the AI for Good webinar series. You're joining us for a panel all about creating safe digital spaces for all through esports and AI. And I'm your host, LJ Rich, BBC presenter, AI, music composer, and many other things besides. And I'm honoured to be spending the next hour with you and some fabulous guests. We are looking at everything from creating educational virtual environments using esports and AI, right through to how to meet the challenges related to safeguarding in esports and the online gaming industry. So what steps do we need to take to make effective policies and standards? What AI tools can help us the most? And what can we learn from esports that can benefit other internet communities? Joining us today, we have a formidable selection of brains for you. First, we have reader in Olympic studies and the social analysis of sport at Canterbury Christchurch University, Dikea Hadzia Stavio, and director of student education programs at Twitch, Mark Garvey Candela, advisor to the Global Sport Esports Federation and co-founder of Yup.gg, Nicholas Aaron Koo, and the University of Salford's Chair in Science Communication and Future Media, Andy Meyer. Please do turn on your cameras and sound. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. And I'm going to start by getting each of you to set the scene, as it were, a few thoughts on what you think the key challenges might be, a kind of state of the union, as it were. And Garvey from Twitch, we're going to start with you. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I love the positive energy so early in the morning here in Seattle. Um, so I think it's really important to understand two things to set a baseline. Why is this really important and what's currently being done outside of being online? So I'll be bringing in a little bit of a discussion on what's going on in education um, with esports and how we're using esports to create this idea of being a digital citizen a citizen recognizing the other for the complementary in them instead of the supplementary or the confrontational in the other. Uh, so I think that's really important. Why is this um, really important as well is Generation Alpha is coming down the pipeline. I know there's a lot of people that's very interested in Gen Z um, and we should be absolutely. But Generation Alpha is coming right down the pipeline. We'll be hitting high school in several years. And I think it's really important because it's the first digitally native generation in history, meaning when they're crying as a baby, they get an iPad or a tablet stuck in front of their face and they're playing simple games. Um, and the esports com com competitors are getting younger and younger every single year. So I think it's really, really important that we address not only a technological um, way with AI, machine learning, um, to create these safe, safe places for these new digital citizens, but also to incorporate it into their lifestyle and in their education, this feeling of being able to work with people that could contribute to expressing your vision in live mediums, online and content creation as you play games. So as we have this discussion, I'll be throwing in a little bit what's going on at universities and high schools all over the world to create these diverse, inclusive, safe spots, um, safe places for students and young people all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Garvey. What a brilliant way to start off. And let's hear a little more now about safe sport and some of the AI tools contributing to safeguarding with Takea. 
Uh, hello from me as well. I'm uh, really excited. It's a, it's a big honor to be here with you today. And uh, I would like to uh, share some ideas uh, in terms of uh, safe digital spaces uh, through esports and artificial intelligence. Uh, well, this is the title of our uh, webinar today. And I would like to emphasize a little bit the word through, which means that uh, these safe digital spaces are not really only uh, about esports, but esports can actually be the leaders into creating those safe digital spaces that can be used outside esports. So it's very important to understand uh, this kind of concept that we're not talking about safeguarding in sport only uh, and in esports, but we are talking how esports can be leaders into the digital space uh, safety and also artificial intelligence. Um, well, uh, Garvey mentioned the digital citizenship, which is extremely important into the era of global citizenship that we're living and particularly into the era of global digital citizenship. Um, some important elements uh, uh, of the citizenship would be, uh, for example, the digital communication, uh, the digital literacy, the digital etiquette, uh, digital law, and there are sort of all too many different also issues of responsibilities and rights. Uh, within these responsibilities and rights, we also need to consider the safeguarding in digital spaces, not just about e-sport. So when we talk about uh, digital citizenship, we need to consider that everybody has this kind of responsibility uh, in terms of not becoming somebody who is doing uh, cyberbullying and of course not to be recipient of, of cyberbullying, uh, cyber predators, uh, posting uh, private information, uh, phishing, scams, malware, and posting something. Uh, people at the very young people in a sensitive age, they don't realize that when they post something in a chat, uh, in a, for example, in an e-sport environment, uh, these can stay there forever. Uh, so it can haunt them. So these kind of issues are uh, very important uh, to note. Uh, I would like to uh, particularly focus on the cyber predators. When we talk about safeguarding in esports and through e and through esports, uh, we cannot really isolate esports from the main uh, environment of sports. And recently, we have so many different incidents of safeguarding, uh, particularly in relation to abuse and harassment. So let's watch this uh, uh, short video uh, about cyber predators. Um, Takeo, I can hear the sound, but we can't see the visuals yet. Sorry, just one second. So I think, uh, no problems. It happens to us all. We're all very used to conference calls now. Everybody watching has had the same experience, so don't worry too much. Normal I... service will be resumed very shortly. Can you see it now? I think you might need to reshare your screen. Okay. Sorry about this. Let's just do this quickly again. So I will go back and uh, reshare my screen, share screen, share, okay. And go into my here and here. Tell me if this works now. It's looking good so far. Let's see, and sound, all good? All good. Beautiful. <laughs> Hey, good game. Want to play another? Can't. It's getting late and I've got school tomorrow. Me too. How old are you? Fourteen. You? Thirteen. But I'm going to be fourteen in two weeks. I can't wait for my birthday. Whereabouts do you live? Southampton. How come? Me too. You should come over to my house so we can play together sometime. 
I'll get, I'll my, get dad my dad to, pick to come you pick you up. Firstly, what are you doing out there? Just gaming with my friends. Wow, that was super creepy. <laughs> it sure was. <laughs> it was creepy. Uh, so I think, uh, let me just go quickly, uh, but it is indeed, things, things like that are indeed uh, happening. And I just wanted to uh, say how uh, artificial intelligence tools can actually help into uh, cyber safeguarding and especially in sports. So for example, the British Esports Federation, they have a, uh, uh, they do. They, they they have incorporated Go Bubble for a real time content moderation, and then uh, in a synergy with IBM and IBM Watch on assistant via gaming avatar, in terms of helping uh, the gamers and uh, for safety and well being, and also they are consulting with uh, the National Society for Prevention of uh, Crime in Children. And also with Yoti, for example, an identity platform with accurate age estimation. So I think just uh, I just wanted to uh, raise awareness about all these issues, and then uh, I think we can uh, open the floor and discuss more in terms of all these rich artificial intelligence tools that can help us uh, into safeguarding, and esports can help us into safeguarding as well. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was some really thought provoking content there. And uh, I think what we're going to do is move over to Andy, who is going to tell us more about how esports and AI are interacting in some cases in real time. So, Andy, you're next. Well, thanks so much. Uh, it's great to be here. I remember last year's sessions and they were fantastic, really great conversations. And uh, and so much has happened in just 12 months, really, since we last met. And uh, I want to speak a little bit to that in, in my sort of five or six minutes. But I, I suppose there are three things I really want to talk about. And it's particularly thinking about what is that relationship between artificial intelligence and esports in the pursuit of safeguarding? Because I think there are some really big wins that are are really brought to the fore by bringing those worlds together that aren't just about esports, but more safeguarding far more widely. And I think it has to do with the fact that, that the esports sector is so embedded and intertwined with the AI industries uh, that, that we can really learn a great deal and advance a great deal in our policies and principles by looking at esports collaborations. So when I think about safeguarding, and I've, I sort of come out of this off, off the back of a two year project looking at the digital wellness of young people and how they utilize digital technologies in a broad, much broader sense than just esports to navigate the world, to build relationships, to bring value into their lives. And it, it's clear, sort of Garvey mentioned at the start, it is so uh, pervasive, it is such a central part of, of a young person's life. Uh, now that it's it's really crucial that we're present within those spaces and I have a 10 year old son who uh, has uh, you know, like many other children sort of skirts the fringes of what's permissible with digital platforms in terms of minimum ages and I think that's a reality that we haven't really come to terms with that in fact many young people are using platforms well before the minimum age and what do we do about that and I think it's part it's complex because partly parents feel very differently about these things some people feel as they may do with a film they might watch an film that's older than the age uh, sort of minimum age of, of, of their child but also but still feel that they can nurture their child's experience in a, in a fruitful way that, that minimizes some of the risks associated with that with that uh, film and similarly with gaming I think that happens a lot so one of the key things I think we have to address is, is the is the recognition that in fact the guidance that's offered by publishers by developers by software um, uh, companies and by platforms is is not allowing us to safeguard effectively so so we need to be strategic and thoughtful and understand how the practice of safeguarding evolves as well, because I think it's, it's never just the sort of predatory adult that's looking out for a child. There's a whole range of things going on. But there are really three things that I guess are, that are pertinent to my take on it all. One is that we, we can use AI in the sort of pursuit and, and monitoring of toxic behaviours. We know that in a range of digital platforms, there's a variety of toxic behaviours that cause concern, not just predatory behaviour of adults towards children, but also the sort of exposure to a range of content that may be risky in a variety of ways to the mental health of young people. So AI employed within this context can help both help us 
develop a much more comprehensive understanding of the language that's used within platforms to understand where there is evidence of risk and, and what can be done about it. I am currently doing a lot of work on TikTok as a, as a platform. And, um, and one of the things that's clear within TikTok is that safeguarding just isn't, isn't effective there, that the users of the community are able to create content in a way that circumvents some of those protections that the platform tries to install uh, in its interface. So the design of the interface needs to be thought through more, more carefully, but there also needs to be, and this may be the more crucial part to the AI uh, uh, integration, is a real-time analysis of emerging risks and how that changes culturally, uh, linguistically, and all, all the complexity of that I think is really critical for us to understand. So there's a huge gain that can be, that can be brought by bringing those two worlds together. I think also in terms of game design, how do we design games that are mindful of a range of, of potential risks that young people face especially so thinking about how representation uh, uh, has meaning and value for the people that play them what, what what is happening when somebody watches or plays a sport an esport title that has narratives within it that may be either really uh, intense or indeed have storylines that are politically problematic how do we think about those risks but the third one is, I think, particularly interesting, and that's how we think about the design of the metaverse. And you may have seen this, this term used in a variety of ways recently, but I think we're, we're finding a way to bring together those physical and digital experiences to create digital worlds where we can seamlessly cross different territories without having to be disconnected from them. And I think in that aspect, the problems and challenges become far greater, but particularly, uh, I think for me, even more interesting in terms of how we design a compelling digital proposition that is actually accessible to all but also break down some barriers so i think i'll leave it there and, and hand over to the next person thanks very much andy brilliant insights as ever and so many things to unpack as usual it feels like we never have enough time even though we have quite a bit of time left together so thank you next up nick thank you so much for your patience you aren't last you're just next and you are ideally placed to give us an overview thanks to over 20 years in esports so please take it away nick well, thank you, LJ, and it's, uh, it's great to to meet everyone and to learn from everyone. I'm uh, from Singapore, and uh, uh, thank you for the upgrade, LJ. I think I'm close to 20 years now in the esports. Uh, I, I lost count, 17, 18, 19. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, at a time, nobody really kind of like made money from from esports, so it was tough, tough to your career. And I went to on to work in technology, right? And uh, I, I eventually ended up in technology investments. Uh, Funny enough, since we're talking about AI, one of the, the, the portfolio investments that I've, I work with is a builder.ai. We use AI to build platforms, software, and all that. And, uh, and yeah, but from a gamer, I also went on to co found a nonprofit to serve fellow gamers. It's called SCOGA, Singapore Cyber Sports and Online Gaming Association. It's been, it was founded in 2007. It's been 14 years, and we've done a lot of work around this uh, topic, around this space, right? So just to maybe give uh, share some maybe bit like a war stories or share, share some 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 work that we've, we've done in the space. So, uh, you know, like internet, um, gaming, esports, some of some of the these uh, spaces where you you interact with uh, strangers and all that could could end up being very unsafe, right? So one of the projects we got involved with was to build an online safe space called Cyberonia. It was in partnership with the police, with the Ministry of Education. Uh, the law society, right, and the, with the industry, mm -hmm. and we, we created this space where uh, all the students, uh, I think age 10, age 11, would have to go online to, to this space. It's like a bit like a mini farm veil, and we would do it cohort-wide across the nation and, and, and play this game, right? And obviously, you can imagine there were some challenges. Some people were a bit nervous, you know, getting kids to go in and, and play this game. Uh, in the real world, we have this thing called the, the road safety park. So we, we, we built this mini park and we get students to go in there and learn about how to be safe on the roads and all that, right? So we did that in real world. And this was our virtual version of it. The online virtual world, you go on and, and, and you learn concepts like cyberbullying, not to be a bully, like how to respect intellectual property, not to get into all sorts of troubles. Uh, and and we, we know we realized that the kids, they know a lot of this, the students, they know a lot of these concepts. But, but I think this was our way of making them um, own the concept, right? To own, to own it, right? To make it into a game, make it social, right? And uh, uh, and I think this project was some time back. It was uh, I think it was almost ten years back. And I think today, uh, we we can we can add AI to it. We can make it a lot more adaptable, a lot more uh, personalized, and all that. So I think that's 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 one aspect. The other aspect of what we do in Skoga is we work closely with um, parents. We work with uh, social service agencies or with kids who are having 
uh, a difficult time sometimes, right? Trying to, to cope perhaps in school. Uh, one example is uh, during the lockdowns for COVID last year, we were approached by more than educators from more than 20 schools. They came to us and they kind of like gave asked us to take care of more than a thousand students, more than a thousand students, right? Uh, and, and we asked them like, what do you want us to do, right? Oh, we want you to help us engage and work with the kids uh, because um, because of the of the lockdown, we can't find some of these kids, right? So what we ended up doing was that we realized that some of these kids found both the online and offline spaces or, or online or offline spaces unsafe. And we worked with the schools and we got them to come out to the school to come and play with us. At first, it was quite interesting. I, I got I got the team to say, okay, let's, let's when they come, let's do esports workshops and classes. After a while, the teachers were like, um, no, we think we just want you to play with the kids, right? We just want you to play. <laughs> this is the first time we were hearing this, right? In the school, the teacher saying, don't teach, just play, right? That was, <laughs> and, 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 and I think we just, just kind of like, to, because these kids were, were having a hard time uh, coping with, uh, with the lockdowns and all that. And, and I think uh, using, uh, it was re really um, uh, interesting, intriguing time for me to, to see how uh, games and esports could be used uh, in, in that way to, to help help the kids, right? So besides my work in uh, Skoga, I also volunteer and serve on a number of uh, boards and nonprofits. And I just want to highlight a couple just to, to bring rele relevance to our discussion, right? One is obviously I'm advisor to the board of the Global Esports Federation. I think the work that we do in Skoga, how do we help kind of like share and have global impact, which is one of the reasons why I'm here. I also volunteer with the National Crime Prevention Council. So we look at crime. Uh, we look at uh, online schemes. So there's been a lot of challenge with online schemes scams um, and, and, and just kind of like just keeping everyone at public at large, uh, how to get them more educated and keeping them safer. Uh, we also have this uh, program called the Delta League, so which is what I'm wearing and promoting, right? So it started as a football league to keep the keep uh, the at-risk youths off the streets, uh, but because of COVID, so we, we couldn't do any more football. And so now we are doing esports, right, to keep uh, to keep the kids engaged, keep them off the, off the streets and all that. Um, I, I also volunteer with the National Council for Problem Gambling. So we look at the issue of gambling. Uh, we, we do a lot of monitoring, a lot of learning, and uh, we study the effects of um, uh, loot boxes and games, uh, at unsafe advertising in esports, uh, possibility of grooming of the kids. Uh, we work with the Ministry of Education and we put certain uh, information about, uh, like for example, loot boxes and all that in, into the curriculum of, of the kids to, to educate them. And uh, I think last but, but not least, uh, I also serve with uh, Comeback. Comeback is a, is, is a counseling service for, for, for uh, young people who struggle with like maybe um, their uh, online habits, um, so maybe perhaps trying to prioritize their, uh, their, their real world and, 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 and all that. And, and one of the projects that we've been looking at is to how do we build, it, build an online virtual therapy space, right? To, to engage with the kids in, in the game, in the character, Right and, and not just in, in, in real life. So I think uh, my, my summary, and we obviously we'll chat more, is that uh, I've, I've worked with many sides of the ecosystem, right? Uh, not, and not just in the tech or the AI part, but I think the, the, the human connections, the partnerships between the different stakeholders and players are really important. And I think with, with AI, we can do a lot more and I'd love to, to, to have more, more conversation about that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick. Excellent. And audience, you are, as ever, invited to post your questions in the Q&A section of the webinar. Some of you are already doing that, which is awesome. Uh, and some of our guests may have lightning fingers and be able to type a response. We are going to try and get through as many questions as possible during our time together. But for now, let's just start off with a few questions <coughs> generated by what we've heard so far. And uh, Garvey and Decaia, I think you've been very uh, gently quiet and patient for the last couple of um, talks. So I'm going to start by opening this back up to the both of you. Maybe Garvey will start with you. Um, I know that one of the things that you like to talk about is the idea of education in an e-sports context and, and business in e-sports and education. So it's a very open question to you, really. Please wax lyrical. Talk about these areas in a way that you find interesting, that you think we, the audience, would find interesting too. Absolutely. So we see a running theme here. We're talking about young people. We're talking about students. We're talking about education, the tools that empower us to scale this idea of having safe digital spaces 
So with Twitch Student, which I founded in 2015, I work in about 28 different countries right now with universities and high schools. And I help them start esports programs that are quite holistic. We focus on community competition and career to create an experience for the entirety of the student body. And it's not about playing video games, right? It's about this idea of creating digital citizens. It's about um, identifying the emerging new and digital media skills that are inherent in esports and gaming that is also truly valuable and transferable in the 21st century. Um, if you combine all this, we're meeting students where they are, we're meeting young people where they are, um, they're obviously online. Twitch, for example, last year we broke all kinds of crazy records uh, that we were looking for ourselves. We had over a trillion minutes viewed um, of live content on Twitch. To make that more palatable, that's 1,900,000 years of live content was consumed in 2020 on our platform. Um, we have a community of about 400 million strong around the world. Um, grows every day. The average median age is 25 years old. So we figured, okay, with Twitch student program, why don't we help universities understand what the space really is? How can we be of the most service to students and young people to create opportunity and to have this understanding of what the business of content creation and esports is, which we break down to, I'll TLDR it, data, right? So this is another little tool that we use to try and create this idea of digital citizens because data does not know artificial societal constructs, doesn't know age, doesn't know gender, doesn't know nationality, things like that. So we try to have people work together that see contributions, inputs and outputs, contributions and results. Um, so it, it being a global program as well, we're having people reach out across the world. And because with the Twitch student program, we're working with university faculty members we know they're of age. We know there's not stalkers um, running around. This is all through universities, official programs, um, sometimes at the varsity scholarship esports level. <clears throat> and I think this is a great complement to technology. Technology does a lot of great things, right? It helps us scale, most importantly. But I think it's really important that we start really young and we, we look at this holistically. We create these digital safe spaces, not only by having the appropriate tooling to police but going in really young. And again, I talked about Generation Alpha before. It's really important to understand it's getting younger and younger. So two years ago, there was a 16-year-old that won a million-dollar Fortnite tournament in New York City, right? We thought, oh, my God, 16 years old. That's really young. What are we going to do? Blah, blah, blah. This year, turns out an eight-year-old won a Fortnite competition. So we can see at, at the evolution, right? The skill sets are, are being adopted a little bit earlier. Now we're going into high schools and into colleges, um, making sure that it's not just about video games. It's about becoming a digital citizen. It's about um, seeing contribution. Um, and it's also about learning these, these really transferable digital media skills. So that's why I really like working with students in education space on this Twitch platform. Um, I think I, we have a lot of tools at Twitch, um, not only on the platform. Um, right now, we're coming up with a, a, an initiative to make sure that our broadcasters, we're seeing what they're doing off of our platform on other social media platforms to get a bigger picture of what's being, what's the narrative, what's the story, how are people interacting with each other? So we're hoping that this combination of technology and working in education to create these really great, inclusive, diverse, and collaborative spaces. And I think that's the key to everything right here is offline collaboration, right? Getting people together, identifying, Mary, you're really good at digital marketing strategies. Joe, you're really good at, um, you know, digital art. Why don't the three of us get together and create something greater than any one of us could have put together ourselves. And again, these students will be looking at people that will contribute in a positive manner. Young people nowadays have this really great idea of pay it forward, right? They're really hoping for the emergence or, or a stronger emergence of what's called the passion economy, which is built on two philosophical tenets, compassionate capitalism and social entrepreneurship. Basically means the absence of zero sum capitalism. They wanna work with others and they wanna to contribute to their improved quality of life. So now if you put this mindset combined with this education and technology being included to make sure that we're scaling it appropriately and we're working with more and more people and we're creating safer and larger spaces for people to come together, collaborate, share, and most importantly, 
express themselves, whether you're a content creator or a community member, right? The ability to express mm -hmm. yourself in a nice, safe place and have that support where you know that the other is looking at you to work with you and, and do cool things that they couldn't do otherwise. Yes, um, brilliant. And we know the Global Esports Federation has a vision for safe, inclusive, healthy esports ecosystems. But the issue of safeguarding is is quite interesting because it's not just esports. Sport more generally has quite a history of, of these areas, abuse, harassment, maltreatment, uh, etc. And I think the risks involved in, in doing esports and the ability to reduce those risks, not just with AI, but maybe with, with other things as well. I think, Takea, this is absolutely your area. So can we bring you in on this? Yes, uh, thank you. Well, I couldn't agree more with what Garvey mentioned. And it's wonderful, all these initiatives you're doing. So very well done. Uh, it's not easy to actually understand. It's a very complex issue to understand uh, uh, all the different risks involved into the digital space. Uh, and um, as you said, LJ, uh, it's an issue about safeguarding in sport more generally. Uh, there are lots of problems into coordinating at the moment, uh, all the different initiatives that are, are existing in, uh, in the world. Uh, there are many, uh, efforts and initiatives to have safeguarding policy in sport, but there are many different fragmented kind of uh, policies and uh, there is not uh, uh, still a common language uh, which is transdisciplinary, uh, which is universal and intercultural and brings together all the different kind of, of communities. When it comes to esports, we need to add one more element into this, because when we talk about issues of equity or, if, or issues of balance in terms of, of, of the globe, uh, well, some of the biggest imbalances are in terms of access to the digital, and access to education. So when we are actually trying to talk about education for the digital, this makes it even more complicated because even if there is some access into the digital, then it is still quite problematic to be followed with a comprehensive uh, educational uh, toolkit. So it's very important to understand, and I would like to pick one question from the Q&A as well about mm -hmm. uh, from Cordell Green that says that there are several digital safeguards that are presuming a literate user, which is not necessarily the case. How can we create safe place for esports without reliance on a literate user audience, which I think this is this is very important. And that is where it comes that many users or even parents and guardians, they don't understand the, the prop, they don't understand the digital space. So how can they actually offer uh, protection to their children? Many times also technology is much faster than, um, than they are. Uh, so I think the, the, the whole issue is, I will go back to what Garvey mentioned in terms of uh, digital citizenship. And this is uh, beyond uh, the digital uh, literacy, uh, because we need to understand that digital literacy can start from very low level. So it's more about understanding uh, issues of digital communication. So it's basic rules of uh, citizenship education really about responsibility, about respecting, about empathy, having an empathy uh, to another citizen. So this is about interaction. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to safeguarding and uh, using artificial intelligence for safeguarding, this does not need our literacy as users. We leave this to the specialists to bring this kind of framework. What we need in our education as um, as parents, as, as university academics, or as coaches, or as participants, what we need is to understand basic things in terms of global citizenship. We respect, we're responsible, we have laws and responsibilities, and uh, there is a digital etiquette, there is a language that we need to, we need to, to really uh, feel that uh, there is a, a community of uh, of respect really i have said a few times the word respect because that's the only really it's the starting point for anything else so i think we need to understand there are issues and challenges in terms of equity and balance 
in the digital access and in the access to education. And also there are uh, many challenges in terms of uh, pitching the level of education for the literate and the non-literate ones. And to understand that it is about education uh, and more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And that is what I wanted to add to this. I, I think I, I just wanted to add that, yeah, the, the, the soft skills that's inherent in esports and gaming, um, the ability to collaborate with people of uh, different people for various reasons are super important. And we emphasize that a lot, especially in the education space, the ability to express the soft skills that's inherent in coming together in these inclusive and diverse collaborative spaces, um, very safe spaces. Um, and just come together and be able to express yourself. I think these soft skills in cover letters are really, really important. So again, these hard skills with AI and machine learning and all these other things complemented with the empathy that's found in the soft skills that's inherent in this very collaborative space. I think this is a really amazing point. Thank you for that. Mm. And that's how esports can actually be a tool for safeguarding in digital space, not working against against safeguarding, but actually working in favor of it, because all these soft skills that the, the kids can learn, if practiced within this kind of framework we said, they can actually be transferred into the safe digital space more generally. I think it's a very interesting scenario where if we presume that people act in their interests of a larger society, it's it's kind of hard to understand the motives of, of when people are doing what is generally called toxic behavior. Mm -hmm. And then we, we get into this really interesting question when we come up to data analysis, which is if we're using machine learning to identify toxic behavior, that's toxic according to whom? And there are so many examples of algorithmic bias as a result of training data. How do we make the data set balanced and clean so that it can be used successfully? And Andy, I think this is a great question for you, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much, LJ. And I want to pick up also, because it relates to Ronan's comment from UNICEF, uh, who talks about open source AI initiatives. And I think there's one of the challenges we face as a society is how to wrestle with the proliferation of AI services and products. And of course, we are already deeply embedded in that world. It's, it's becoming a bigger feature of many aspects of our lives. And yet we still think about the value of AI in a proprietary way. So the principles of digital public goods, the idea that there is something that we all should be doing together to maximize the potential of AI to protect humanity is at the heart of, I think, this question. And what I've seen over the last few years, um, last couple of years especially, is a, a growing desire to think about ethics and artificial intelligence. In my mind, we need to think about artificial intelligence as, a, as an emergency service, rather like we do think of the police, the healthcare service. These are, these are protocols that protect citizens. And in that sense, for them to be wrapped up in proprietary um, protocols, I think it is deeply short-sighted. So it goes back again to what I was talking about at the start with this concept of the metaverse. It begins with a sense of the public good where uh, technologies, products, services can be harnessed to mitigate some of those risks. And I think we've seen that sort of debate take place over the last 12 to 15 months with the pandemic, where we've seen questions about pharmaceuticals have similar sorts of inquiries as to whether we can justify both the development of these sorts of drugs that are good for everybody, vaccinations that are good for everybody, in a way that then is proprietary and at some point expensive to some populations. So I think we need to revisit this notion of, of AI as an emergency service to help us get to a point where a range of sectors can really collaborate within that space. I would want the healthcare service in the United Kingdom to be free to enter the gaming spaces to do what they do best without those, in, those barriers to the data, to the protocols and so on. Okay, thank you. And Nick, I'm going to bring you in here because this is, we're talking a little bit about where the line should be between developers, publishers, gamers. What, what do you think about this? I, I think first of all, first of all, I think, um, uh, you know, there was earlier points made about uh, toxic behavior and uh, Kavi's points on, on soft skills. And uh, I think one thing I want to say is that I found that esports actually helps a person build pretty amazing 
digital muscles or muscles or digital skills, right? Uh, and and, and I, I've seen gamers uh, from from gaming uh, with no other uh, uh, like without without their MBAs and their PhDs and all that, and they've gone on to become great financial traders, right? Some of the best traders I know in Singapore uh, were, were were great gamers, right? Uh, we've seen a lot of examples of gamers who actually went on to become good in um, cybersecurity. Some of them went into hacking, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, but 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 uh, this um, esports and uh, it really helps someone to to build amazing uh, digital skill sets and muscles. Right? In a sense, I myself uh, have have acquired many uh, skills right from from my, my time in esports. Uh, I think I've mentioned about the the soft skills and how to, how to work with people, collaborate across remote teams, uh, online. Uh, my typing speed went from like went up to like hundred more than hundred words. Per, per minute because of esports and all that, but I think we must understand that with that certain, I think that certain uh, power, you know, uh, you almost like can say that uh, a bit of the digital uh, 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 supremacy, right? In a sense that you could uh, a lot of a lot of these um, esports participants, they are very young and you know, they don't realize what to do with some of this this uh, uh, power. You know, they they don't realize that sometimes they end up uh, being a bully. Right and uh, and and I think I think more can be done right to help kids to realize that that uh, uh, with you know it's a saying right with great power comes great responsibility and, and what I just I just wanted to to uh, to mention I think I think about that I think right, as far as um, I think about about developers right are, are concerned and I think uh, it's it's not the um, I, I think it, it's, it's it's a very collaborative very holistic very comprehensive effort that requires from for all parties right it's not just about developers not just about policymakers not just about parents sometimes when i speak to to parents right it's very easy to say oh um the government's not doing enough right and then uh, <laughs> or speaking to, to someone else say oh the, the 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 parents are not doing enough right it's it's it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult right and i think I can say, oh, AI is not doing enough. We should, <laughs> we should, we should get get AI to uh, to, to 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 do more, right? And and perhaps one of the things that I also want to uh, want to, I think there was a question, uh, was it from 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 Jonathan, right? Said so that uh, how can safeguarding practices uh, within esports be transferred and 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 made it to other hybrid events like music music festival? And uh, I I it's strange, right? Because esports has been around for I want to say at least in my my time. Uh, 15, 20 years, right? 15, 20 years. And I, I'm, I'm not sure we figured everything out. I'm not sure we figured everything out. And I think uh, with this whole new world of uh, virtual events, hybrid events, music festivals, I think people are just kind of like just uh, finding their feet. Uh, water is, is finding, you know, finding the levels and all that. And I think it'll take a while for the water to settle down, find its level. And, and, and but but uh, there, there are some things that I think uh, uh, it can be learned from. And I think AI, right, is in the best, best way to take all that learning uh, from across so many disciplines, so many games. There are so many different type of uh, titles across esports, and, and how do you distill that with a uh, big brain AI, right? And 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 then apply it across. Um, and and I think and it can help inform uh, policymakers. It can help inform uh, game developers. And, and I, I think I believe that I always believe that uh, it's good business for game developers to make games that are safer, right? If they can make Games that are, 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 are safer, more family friendly. It should be it should be good business or better business. Mm. It's a maybe there should be some kind of guideline document drawn up between everybody that can help people understand why things, how to how to move things forward, how to encourage people, nudge them into the behaviours that are more in keeping with the arena. I mean, this is really like many of the events that we do here. It's about opening a dialogue. So audience, if you have ideas and thoughts and questions and comments, please feel free to join in. And, and perhaps some of you may even want to take a more active role in, in moving this, this idea forward. Um, now, at the time of recording this, we're actually living through a, a pandemic, which has accelerated our need for remote interaction and a massively increased our reliance on connectivity. So I'd love to to hear what's surprised you most during your this time in esports specifically this time i guess that's to anybody <laughs> i i would say that nothing surprises me anymore in esports and gaming um and i always joke around and say that we're building the plane we're flying in so we <laughs> don't really have expectations especially when it's such a community driven industry 
Um, you know, I really feel like publishers and platforms, we're, we're really just in the service of the community. Um, it's large, it's vibrant, it's young. Um, it's a really exciting space. Um, so I think that's really important to keep in mind that it's a very young space and um, sometimes it's better for us to um, just listen, be an active listener for the community and, and understand what their pains are and how to address it. And, uh, you know, there's a big problem that I'm thinking about with this toxic nature that I don't know how AI um, can really address this, but I, I think a lot of this comes from the anonymity that's inherent in, in gaming and esports. And I think what we're doing um, with, especially in the university space, teaching people about what brand building means, um, being able to express yourself, becoming an influencer, which is the um, hot ticket item now um, for a lot of young people, this is what they aspire to be. Um, so what does that really mean? What does that look like? Um, I think it's time for us to just listen a little bit, supply the tools that we can um, it's also really important, and Andy can maybe um, elaborate on this a little bit. There's a lot of great scholarly research. This is another great reason why I love being in the education space, is that there's educators that's actually going through the paces and doing a lot of scholarly research and putting together esports journals. And, you know, what, what does this really look like? Um, what does it mean for parents? What, what kind of interactions are available? There's so much scholarly research out there just on machine learning, AI, down to the soft skills, down to how physiotherapy and nutrition can be incorporated into the esports ecosystem to create a more, um, not only safe space, but healthy space as well. So I'd love to hear um, Andy talk a little bit about um, the journal and, and scholarly research and how this can help us all gain a better understanding of how we could be in the service of young people and the opportunities that, that lie in front of them right now in digital media. Thanks so much, Gavi. And yeah, we launched a journal last year, the International Journal of Esports, which is now, I guess, drawing upon the fact that so many people around the world are researching this environment. And it's really exciting to see all the different sorts of things that are taking place. But you mentioned there, Gavi, listening is so important. And I guess one of the things that sort of answer your question, RJ, as to what's been most surprising over the last year for me is, is just trying to see how many people are trying to find their way into esports and understand that world. And of course, the sports world is, is perhaps one of the best examples. And I want to just sort of show you a sense of what, what's, I guess, shaped my understanding about what's happened over the last 12 months. And this is a video from quite recent where we're seeing uh, triathletes now utilize the platform Zwift to create arena-based experiences, which allow them to have competitions within enclosed environments of course, because we've not been able to have events taking place due to COVID. But I think that, you know, we have a lot of sort of controversy over the relationship between sports and esports. But I think the sports world is really trying to find a way into it because they're very mindful of the fact that young people are gravitating towards these alternative experiences, which are by now not alternative at all. They're incredibly mainstream. And in fact, an expectation of young people, if you don't have digital integration within your activity, regardless of whether it's sport, music, whatever it is, then you're going to be losing out a big part of your experience. So I think events like this show us that the sectors outside of esports are really trying hard to find a way into that world and learning from it. And I think that's where we as sort of in the esports world need to really I guess, draw on that desire to be part of it and allow our boundaries to be fluid and, and make sure that we, I guess, benefit from also that long history that surrounds those practices. LJ mentioned at the start that, you know, the, the sports world has had its own problems with, with safeguarding, which I'm sure Decay can talk more to, but it's how can you find best practices across all sectors to shape this world? And I think that's what we need to be focusing on. Mm. And in fact, Takea, I was going to ask you if there's an effective way to educate or incentivize taking responsibility for online behavior. Have, I, I suspect this is not yet, but we're working on it as an answer. But um, please elaborate. Well, I think this has to start from the very early ages, because as I think Garvey mentioned, they, they, they are bored and now they, they just want an iPad. You can see the, the generation, the new generation. They are literate. I have a daughter, she's only three years old, and I think she's watching us right now with my, <laughs> with my mother. And she can understand, she, she understands the whole concept. She, she understands what Zoom is, she understands what uh, the Viber is, she can call me. So we are in a, <laughs> exactly. so we, we are in a completely different generation now. Uh, so I think we have um, more responsibility for education, but also uh, better chances to be understood into this kind of literacy that is a kind 
kind of embedded in, embedded into this uh, generation. Uh, so I think uh, we need, for example, I, I have been writing at the moment, I have just completed an educational uh, toolkit for the National uh, Olympic Committee in Greece uh, to be distributed to Greek schools uh, for uh, specifically for um, safe sport. And one part of it is specifically about safe sport uh, and in esports, how they can use the digital. And this is, we're talking about ages of five to 12. Wow. So um, that these are the things, this is, a, it has not been approved yet. We have writing it and we are now in process of uh, submitting it to the ministry. But we, uh, these kind of initiatives of the International Olympic Truth Center, for example, and the National Olympic uh, Academy in Greece, uh, the, these, are, uh, these are the things that we need to do. This kind of organization, stakeholders, take over this kind of educational initiatives. And also another thing that also kind of um, can be a little bit uh, concerning and needs to have some kind of education again element is many young people now they go into, uh, they have their own YouTube channels for gaming because they, they, they have this. So they, they go there, they open their own YouTube channel and they compare scores, they talk with others. So they are exposed to a, mm. a, a very big different world out there. So that's why we need to be more careful. They need to know from school, from parents, how they can do, if they do a YouTube channel, the parents need to know it, the parents need to understand this. YouTube as a platform needs to have safeguarding tools to be able to, to spot any toxic behaviors. And I just wanted to just say how concerned were all these issues about Jonathan Galindo game or the blue whale. Uh, and there were lots of, uh, uh, concerns from parents that they don't understand what exactly are all these games, what's going on, how dangerous it is. So I think again, uh, from young age, primary, even nursery, uh, mm -hmm. up just to understand what is the good practice of, of the online. Kind of guidelines think, for parents and caregivers. Um, Nick, you were about yeah, to say I, something. I think the care is talking about uh, Twitch channels. Not <laughs> but uh, no, uh, you know, actually, I, if I can add on, I think uh, I think one of the things that that uh, really surprised me for uh, during during COVID was uh, the fact that we had schools and educators asking us to have to have kids to come online uh, with uh, and play play with us and not just not just uh, 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 you know uh, come to learn with us and all that. And that I think one of the realization was that that esports and gaming can be safer than the real world. Right in in some sense, and that I think uh, I think I think this is a bit of a joke, but I think esports or, or COVID really accelerated the conversation about the real issues. Right, it's not just about no longer about oh, is esports a sport and, and 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 all of that. But I think the fact that 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 esports is here to stay, right, and the real conversations about is is it safe? How do we make it safe? How do we make it safer? I think to Takeo's point about like the 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 online dangers, the kind of exposure. Uh, how, and, and I think I, I'm just so excited because that, I think we're getting down to to the real the real 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 questions and, and working together on the real issues and I think just folks coming together like like just like today right from all all walks all discipline coming together to find uh, to work on, on on problems finding solutions together I think I'm just really excited by all of that and I can you see know, everyone answering questions in the Q&A by text as well as so smoothly engaging them in, in including them into your conversation. I'm aware of the time when nearing the end of our panel together, I knew there wouldn't be enough time for this. So what I'm going to do is ask each of you for a few final thoughts and um, first, um, our audiences for these events are pretty special, actually. So if there's one thing you'd like to do or something you'd like to raise awareness of in one or two sentences so I can get you all in, please. What is the one thing you would like to raise awareness of or, or like to do? So I think I'll start with you, Andy. Well, I guess for me, it's, it's I'm very focused on this idea of the metaverse. For me, it's, it's a place in which we can all sort of participate on an equal footing. So embracing this idea that we need to design a, a digital world that's integrated with the physical world and make that accessible to everyone is, is where I would see this future. Thank you. And um, Dikea, would you like to go next? Yes, well, uh, I think for me is this kind of understanding that esports can actually be used as a way for safeguarding digital space more general rather than the other way around. And to understand that the soft skills like empathy are key to understanding uh, the power of esports and not 
only hard skills, as we said before, but the soft skills like empathy. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. Nick? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, we talk about safe spaces online, and I think the online world, the digital world, gaming, and even esports can be quite unsafe at times, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? So is the real world, right? The real world can be also be quite quite unsafe. I think, I, I believe, I mean, the reason why we're here is that I believe that uh, AI can help. I think we've seen a number of examples where AI has made uh, has helped in make things, make things better, but but I think there's still a lot of work to be done, and I think in the meantime, as I as I highlighted, I think the coming together of um, uh, folks from from the different perspectives from the spectrum, right, parents, gamers, policymakers, uh, industry coming together to work together to 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 work at the real problems, finding solutions together, and then how can we employ technology and AI to to bring the work further? Mm, brilliant, thanks, Nick and Garvey. Over to you. I, um, yeah, I, for me, there's no one size fits all solutions. I think we need to complement technology with um, how everybody's talking about soft skills and empathy. Um, I think just having an understanding and meeting young people where they are and being there for them and making them feel like their voice and what they have to say is really important. That could remove some of the anonymity that I think is a, a core reason for a lot of this toxic behavior online. Um, support young people and what they're doing. Um, and when you hear esports and education, please don't think about Cartman and South Park playing Dungeons and Dragons in his, in his basement. They're learning these incredible, incredibly valuable digital media skills in school through a medium that makes education a hobby and not a chore. And I think that's extremely important. We're creating these great international networks as well to make sure that people are having respect for other cultures, other languages, other accents, different kinds of foods, um, creating these experiences that aren't just about um, professional growth, but personal growth. And that's what I think esports is all about. That's what content creation and having the ability to express yourself um, is really important. And I just think there needs to be a lot of work to make sure that we clean this up and that when voices are being heard, it's in a positive manner, or at least not to the detriment of others. Yes, a lovely sentiment to wind up our time together. So thank you very much, Dakea, Nick, Andy and Garvey. Thank you all so much for your time today. And thank you also to the Global Esports Federation, the ITU, our amazing tech and AV team, and you, as ever, our wonderful and engaged audience. Um, I'd like to mention that tomorrow is the UN World Creativity and Innovation Day. It's the 21st of April. And check out the website for more on the AI for Good series. It will be a pleasure to see you all online another time. I've been LJ Rich. Thank you so very much. And it's back over to Ida at the ITU. Thank you very much, LJ. And a big thank you to all our panelists, as well as the participants for making it such an interesting discussion. It feels like one hour was not enough, but I'm sure there, there's more to come. So now we are opening a quick poll with one question. So please just give it a quick answer and let us know how much uh, you liked this session. And in the meantime, while you do that, I'd like to encourage you to check out the AI for Good program online to see more sessions that may be of interest to you. So for example, this week is a busy one. Uh, tomorrow we have the next Innovation Factory pitching session and also the next Machine Learning for 5G challenge. Um, so tomorrow, April the 21st. And then on Thursday, the 22nd of April, we also have the next Trustworthy AI session. So we are posting the links to those sessions uh, in the chat and we er, encourage you to register and join. And with that, we have reached the end of the webinar and would like to once again thank everybody involved, the panel, participants, partners, sponsors, and our co-convener, Switzerland. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Fun times! Fun, fun, fun! I feel like we could have went on for like another five hours. <laughs> Easily. Or at least I could have. <laughs> As Nick and Andy know quite well. We're still live, Garvey. <laughs>
rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Hello, so the broadcasting and the recording has been finished. Hooray! Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. You rocked it. Thank I was you, absolutely you. fascinated by all of your bits and pieces and brain-like <laughs> stuff. It's always one of these frustrations that we could we could talk for longer, but there's also the kind of what's the limit of normal humans' ability to receive information. <laughs> And I don't know if any of us are normal humans. So uh, <laughs> I do hope that Garvey's fun times is on the final edit. It absolutely will be. <laughs> That's a highlight for me. <laughs> We've had that a few times.